welcome to the MTA Podcast Series, a weekly audio cast featuring interviews with recognized industry professionals, and your host, Ed Carlson. It was like water torture as a parade of bad signals marched by, each flipping us the bird. Sorry, Edwards and McGee, your time has passed. Today's guest is Michael Kahn, America's doorman to technical analysis for investors both sophisticated and otherwise. Tuesday, September 22, 2009. Michael, a Barron's contributor since 2001 with his Getting Technical column, a contributor to Market Watch, SFO Magazine, and he edits the Daily Markets newsletter, Quick Takes Pro. Michael has an MBA from NYU and three books on technical analysis, the second of which is coming out with its third edition in a few months in five languages. Michael, welcome to the program. Hey, thanks. Great to be here. Great, great. Listen, Michael, I know everyone's eager to get to current events, but let's start with a little background on just who Michael Kahn is. Uh, Bring us up to date. What were you, what were you doing prior to uh, technical analysis? I was um, kind of kind of at whatever job someone got for me um, right out of college. I was actually working at um, Merrill Lynch at the time when I first started on Wall Street because you know my dad knew someone and I kind of liked it and I was working the Muni Bond desk and um, starting to work with computers at the time. Computers are really just starting on the trading desk. Uh, from there, I answered an ad to be a product manager for a charting company. I re- didn't really know what that was, but it sounded interesting. I moved over there, and uh, here I am now a technical analysis product manager. And, of course, I had to learn what I was talking about. And uh, in getting started, uh, I was telling the customers what we were doing to the software. And... We started writing a, a monthly uh, how-to type of newsletter, how to, how to use an indicator, how to use a trend line, things like that. And it just took off from there. I just kept doing it and uh, started writing my own articles and turned into a book. It turned into a, a career. It got me, uh, got me noticed. And um, from, from that job, though, I moved over to um, Knight Ritter Financial. And uh, I, was, I was starting then. Uh, we're about to be bought by Bridge Information Systems, and for for most people who've never heard of them, you shouldn't have because now now they're gone, a little victim of their own uh, ambitions. Anyway, I became <laughs> I, be, I became a uh, a technical analysis writer for the news division, and I started putting out levels and uh, talking about simple chart patterns and things like that. And from there, you know, I just got up to the title of chief, chief technical analyst for Bridge News, and um, you know, here I am. I got noticed by uh, the Nightly Business Report, and um, then Barron's Online found me. They needed to replace John Murphy in his column, which was getting technical, and they uh, asked me, and I got John's blessing, fortunately, and, and here I am today. Well, well, how did you learn about technical analysis? Were you already a member of the MTA at that time? Uh, were you self-taught? What, uh, how, it, how, it, you was, it was self-taught. It was by the bootstrap, so to speak. It was definitely self-taught, and, uh, you know, I had to know what the customer wanted on our software, this is a couple jobs ago, I had to know what they wanted, so I had to learn about it and I had to tell the programmers how to make it, so I needed to know the formula, I needed to know what need, what parameters were variable, what were fixed, how long it goes, uh, what kind of data it needed, the whole deal. And it was, yeah, self-taught. Um, my boss at the time was a member of the MTA and a, and a trader technician type. And from I, that was about mid-'90s. And I just have been a member since then. Uh, my boss, I don't think, is a member anymore. Um, and uh, you know, I got involved. I stayed involved. And um, really, it really was self-taught until very recently. I only got my CMT in 2008. So um, it took a while before I made it official. I see. I see. So you really had to dig into those indicators and really uh, roll your sleeves up and get your hands dirty in order to explain them to the uh, programmers. Well, yeah, we had to know the exact formula. And then it was whose formula do you use? And then which formula do the traders actually want it to use? And which parameters did they want to have control over? You know, they, everyone was stuck on this 14 day RSI, which, of course, was uh-huh. just the way it came. That's the way I believe right. it came out of Wells Wilder's book. And that's what people coded into their software, and that was that. And, you know, it's not the way the traders wanted it. So just a simple thing like allowing them to change that parameter. How many days do you want in your formula Uh was the first step. And then we moved on to stochastics. Okay, now we have fast, now we have slow, and 
and how do you smooth it with the slow and make it second slow and you know so it was a whole whole type of of uh, researching of what people wanted and what the programmers were able to give us. Mm-hmm. Tell us what you're doing today. What uh, What's your typical day look like? I know you're uh, involved with an RIA, Emerald Asset Strategies, down in Florida, but of course you don't live in Florida. Well, uh, I, I did for a little bit. But, uh, oh, did you? That, that, that's, that's another story. Um, my, day, <laughs> my day starts out with my newsletter, um, a couple hours in the morning before the market's open to figure out what's going on, what I should tell people, what's important to know about, what happened. I like to include some technical analysis lessons in the newsletter. I call it just today's lessons, how clever. Um, there's uh, sometimes some sector work, sometimes um, just stock picks. I hate to use that term, picks, but just interesting charts yeah. that I like. And you know that goes out before the open. And then on, on days where I have to write my column for Barron's, you know, I spend there the good chunk of the uh, the middle of the day writing the column and, and getting it edited and putting the charts together. And then in the evening, uh, you know, what happened today? You know, I've got to look back and see what happened. Uh, of course, as an entrepreneur, um, I'm not an employee of Barron's. I am a freelancer officially. So as an entrepreneur, I have to keep looking for business and trying to make some connections. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a long process. Um, and since I do work by myself, it's... Uh, it's never ending. Well, <laughs> you, what, can, you can uh, hear the you know, sigh in my voice. Not. Yeah. What uh, uh, What are you What are you doing with Emerald Asset Strategies? With Emerald, I am a I am couple part uh, couple parts couple of hats. One is a consultant to uh, the fund manager, and that is to let him know what I think about the markets and what's changing, and to let him bounce ideas off of me. So he'll get a fundamental idea. He'll say, "What do you think?" and we'll look at and discuss it for a little bit. Um, there is a regular research meeting we have where we'll actually discuss the portfolio, what we want to do, what changes we want to make. And then there's the intangible of spreading the word, and, and of course, uh, the business end is trying to get more assets under management. Mm-hmm. Are you involved in that at all? Well, indirectly. You know, I have, I have a pretty big soapbox to use, and while I can't use Barron's for that, I have other, other places where uh, people know me and um, they come to read what I have to say, including my blog. And, you know, I like to just put a word here or there about uh, the fact that it is available, of course, there's all kinds of compliance restrictions, but um, just to let, let them know when people say, you know, I like your stuff. Do you manage money? Well, now I can say yes. Ah, wonderful, wonderful. You know, I loved, I mean, I loved this quote that uh, you, you put at your blog from Ralph Vince. Anytime I found myself calling on myself to be patient about a move, it was because I was fighting the damn thing. P- patience equals I am wrong. Well, again, I want to stress that's from Ralph Vince and not from me. I just yeah. could just pick that up off the uh, market list. That was great. That was great. Um. You know, at your blog, you write, sorry, Edwards and McGee, your time has passed. There's a lot of people out there talking about uh, the time has passed for the efficient market hypothesis, but many of us thought that this perhaps could be the golden age of technical analysis. Uh, Are you saying something different, or perhaps you could expand on that? I'm saying that. First of all, I never believed efficient market, uh, whatever they call it. As you can tell, I have total respect for it. Um, the thing of the Ed, Edwards and McGee comment, you know, is, of course, is a blog, and, and that's where I finally get to be a, a real, you know, a real wise guy instead of my nice corporate <laughs> type. Of, you know, I can't really can't really do that kind of stuff for Barons. Okay, uh, right. Okay. I, yeah, I was part wise guy, but but uh, it's kind of reflecting of what a lot of people are saying, and of course, it's a lot of people like me at, at a lot of the times this year, and like that quote from Ralph and. Um, you know, the things we were taught just haven't been working. And the question you have to ask is, is it because things have changed or I'm not applying it correctly or a combination or is there some intangible out there? And a lot of people, a lot of people on my blog and commenters will say, you know something, I'm leaving the business now. Things aren't working. This is a total liquidity market and nothing that we're doing is working. Of course, it's not quite true. Plenty of, of technicians are, are doing the right thing and making money. But it, to me, it is definitely it's not the way it's supposed to happen. And, and while I'm trying to adapt to it and do different things and, and relax certain assumptions, um, I don't want to have to do that. You know, I don't want to see 90% of my breakouts fail. 
You know, that's very frustrating to someone who's, uh, who's been trained that, you know, this happens, then the odds are that that should happen. And, you know, I know it's the odds, it's not a guarantee. But, you know, when the odds go from, say, 60 or 70 percent to 10 percent, you've got to question, you know, what am I doing? So mm-hmm. that's, that's where the quote came from. And, no, I, I still believe technical analysis is here to stay, and I'm still doing it. And, um, you know, it's, it's the golden age. I think that last year was a wake-up call to people who didn't believe in technical analysis, and they are in the bandwagon now. Uh-huh. Well, there's, there's a lot of indicators that have been giving technical an- analysts fits recently. One of them has been volume, uh, the consolidated tape, uh, off ex- off exchange transactions, high frequency trading. Um, well, can, can you talk about some of the indicators that uh, you, you've given up on, as well as some that uh, you 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 like or are at least interested in at this point? You know, I don't want to say given up on. You know, again, it's not the indicator or the concept of the indicator that's bad. It's it's either the way I'm applying it or the conditions in the market have changed where something's off. Uh, the easiest example, I guess, for people is the one we go from the, the eighths to pennies. You know, mm-hmm. So what con- now constitutes an uptick or what constitutes a uh, positive change for the day? You know, is it a penny or is it an eight or is it something that really means something? So, you know, it just seems that this, any indicator based on this sort of thing is now different. It's got to work differently. You've got to read it differently. You've got to apply it differently, um, if it works at all. You know, I'll have to throw that out there. I think some of them maybe don't work anymore. But you get something like something depending on price change. And that price change is so tiny that it could be noise. It could be, you know, a guy with his, his odd lot order changing the entire indicator for the day. Um, with volume specifically, um, yeah, with volume taking place all over the place, you know, not necessarily in the traditional New York Stock Exchange venue. And then you have um, so many strategies and so many ways to do strategies that, you know, is the volume on this ETF because someone's a bull or because they bought the ETF and shorted something else or they played options against it? You know, you just don't know anymore. So you just take it with a grain of salt, relax your assumptions, and see if there's something of value in it that's different than it was before, but there's still value. Um, I remember one example, instead of looking at absolute value, look to see if there's a bump up in value on a certain day when an event happens. So it's just a a different way to apply these indicators which don't seem to work the way we assume them to work. And And I stress that word, assume. When when things start breaking down in this manner, it makes me wonder if perhaps we're getting to the top of the market. Uh, Michael Kahn, is, is the craziness back? I, I see the trading volume at Schwab, TD Ameritrade, and, and E-Trade surged 14% in August ver- versus July. Are we partying again like it's 1999? Well, th- there's an application of volume, you know, w- which is helpful. So I can't say that volume no longer works. Um, but, yeah, that's that's... Definitely one indication. I think sentiment work um, is probably the thing that's holding up best in terms of um, the way we expect indicators to to, uh, to do their jobs. Um, I actually made a, a comment recently that um, volume on the, the last couple of days of the run-up, maybe last week, was suddenly surging. You know, why was volume so heavy that much into a, a rally? You know, in, instead of at the breakout, above the previous high, if you can visualize these things on a podcast. Um, why was the, ra- the volume surging there? And it, was it because everyone's saying, well, I've got to get in on this thing, you know, six months later. Mm-hmm. I don't want to be left behind anymore. So, yeah, w- w- your original question was, are we parting like 1999? And, and you know, maybe, that's, maybe that is an indication that um, the little guy is getting back in. And exactly. of course, of course, you know, when the little guy finally decides six months after the move and fifty percent, um, <laughs> well, it, you know. it, it brings to it, it calls the question: Is the party about over? And uh, you know, if you've ever stayed to the end of a party, you know, you get the vacuum, and it makes you wonder if uh, America's investment accounts are about to get vacuumed again. Um, tell a story that you mentioned at your blog about an infomercial of an NFL coach. Do you remember that one? Oh, yeah. Um, t- to me, this is not that the market has peaked, but I think that stock trading has peaked. 
and we, I'll use the term jump the shark. Like, uh, well, I think everyone knows what that means by now. It's um, the old uh, happy days and Fonzie. Uh, well, the idea, it, it, it's also when, when, you, when, um, when it, uh, here's another example of that. When, when a sitcom brings Ted McGinley into the cast, you know their show's about over. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. Uh, well, well, but, but can you, can you uh, remember the commercial you were referencing with the uh, coach? Yeah. They don't have to I give the product name. I, I don't actually remember the product name. I do remember it was a system for trading stocks, and it was aimed at retail, and you, know, you see the infomercials late at night, and it was Coach Jimmy Johnson. Uh, best known for the Cowboys and his and his hairdo, um, he gets on there and he's telling about how he's trading stocks and wow, this is great and look what you can do. And he looks at the camera and he says whatever he, whatever he's paid to say, and he said something uh, about what indicators are in there. And let me, what was the phrase he used? I A fifty moving day moving, average. Moving day average. Fifty moving day average. And I said, <laughs> said he's doing a commercial for stock trading using indicators, which is basically the technical analysis, and he just blows this very basic name. And I'm thinking, you know something, this has just jumped the shark. I think stock this trading has had the it. The investment, yeah. the investment world is, is just not, not going to be the same again. It's gone mad. Uh, speaking of mad, uh, you know, insiders are selling like mad. Just last week, Bob Toll, the CEO of Toll Brothers, sold 1.6 million shares of their stock. I thought we would uh, wrap up or conclude the podcast today with some of your thoughts on where do you think the market's headed? Uh, I did notice you said something about a low of 400. You sound like Robert Prechter. No, no that, that was um, a blog post where I use basic technical analysis measuring techniques and put up the absolute worst case. And I put right on the post, I don't believe it's happening. So oh, no, I no, no, no 400 on the S&P. <laughs> okay. uh, well, what are your thoughts on the immediate and not so immediate future? I'm, I'm the first to admit that I wildly underestimated the, the size of this rally. You know, I, I never dreamed it would get up this high. You know, I, I know back in March I wrote in Barron's. I remember that the, the column name was suddenly not so bad. You know, and that was the the day after you had this big surge to the upside after Armageddon practically. So it's not like I was a perma bear and I stayed that way. You know, but after a couple hundred points, I said, okay, I think we need to flush out more and and get this market, um, you know, more sanity. It doesn't seem like there's enough fear. Things seem to be back to normal too quickly. So my own feeling was that uh, we needed another pretty pretty scary uh, flushing out of the market. Uh, unfortunately, the market didn't uh, didn't really listen to me, and it kept going and going and going. Um, but I think risk is is definitely in the market now. I mean, a lot of risk, and um, where it's going to stop, I stop saying, and when it's going to stop, I stop saying. Just because. Well, let, let's I say it stops. To Let's say it stops today, Michael. What do, you, what do you foresee, or do you have a view? Uh, are we going to retest the August lows, the March lows? My, my, are we going to make a new my low? View is, my view is, uh, is somewhere in the, in the uh, 20%, maybe 30% area. And I, can't, I don't want to put a number on it because that means sure. uh, I'm assuming a top. So 10% would have been a, a reasonable correction. 20% is that scary correction. I, I had another thing for my blog. And more than that, maybe 20 to 30 percent is probably uh, what I think we need. You know, when the market doesn't care what I think, but um, you know, I, I just can't see how how a, a bear market of that magnitude puts in a V bottom. And you know, I don't believe we saw an inverted head and shoulders, and I, I just don't believe that was true. Um, I, I don't think that the interpretation of the chart pattern was was proper enough for me. So I do see. Um, some sort of scary correction coming. Definitely did not see the old lows, though. I think we did bottom in March. Mm -hmm. I see. All right. Well, before we go, do you want to uh, give the listeners your blog address or anything else? I'm sure I put up a chart of the day at um, my website. It's quicktakespro.com. And that's one word, quicktakes, plural, uh, pro.com. And I've got you know links to uh, the blog there and... and um, there's a, a, my favorite books and things like that, and um, and of course the commercial thing to the newsletter. But I don't think readers of this podcast care about that. Well, who knows? It's uh, it's really been a very interesting discussion this morning. I can't tell you how much we appreciate having you on the podcast. And um, that wraps up today's MTA podcast. I'm Ed Carlson in Seattle. 
You can follow me at fatechnicaladvisor.blogspot.com or contact me at fatechnicaladvisor at comcast.net. Send us your comments and suggestions. Let's keep our stops tight, people, and good day.